So we start in the next talk is uh, use of uh, OSM to support uh, medical humanitarian operations uh, of Doctors Without Borders. So over to you. Thank you. Hi, we are from Médecins Sans Frontières, an organization that was founded in 1971. So we're a little over 50 years old. And uh, our mission has been to help vulnerable people where it's needed the most in contexts such as displacement, conflict and instability, or outbreaks of diseases. And a couple years back, in 2014, MSF decided to create the GIS Center to support uh, its operation through GIS. So it's a, it's a small team uh, constituted from, um, with a couple people at HQ coordinating the GIS needs and a, a team of a remote mapper trying to support remotely the, our projects and operations and also a couple of uh, deployable uh, field GIS specialists uh, who can go there when there's a critical GIS needs uh, and where we think it would make a significant significant difference to our operation. My colleague Sarah started as a GIS specialist in the field in countries such as Zambia, Zimbabwe, Democratic Republic of Congo, Yemen, or Bangladesh. And she focused on um, helping in these outbreaks, on recruitment and training, and also in general mapping, for example, refugee camps for reference map. And Yana, she, she supports uh, with uh, community uh, support community uh, in engaging uh, with a missing map, organizing mapathon. She supports as well with communication about all of this. And I should say Sarah's current role is a GIS advisor. As such, she functions as an important relay between the field where we have about 50% of our GIS center staff and the headquarters, such as, for example, the mapping team and helping to define solutions with geographic information systems for the needs advocated at the mission level. These are just some of the headlines from the emergency situations in the past year when we have activated the missing maps as well as GIS response. And uh, in this, um, we have often gathered data. Missing maps is a consortium of about 20 organizations that we co-founded in 2014. We had a GIS week in Prague at the end of June where we had on my impulse a talk on the use of GIS to support our operations in Ukraine. And I asked how many of our maps used OSM? Guess what was the answer? Almost 100% said Sarah. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, it's a very precious source of information for all our maps. So we use that as base maps. We use that as data to create our own custom maps where we can do more analysis, for example, adding our patient's origins or uh, presence of some conflicts or uh, the, the water network situation. But we use uh, OSM data for pretty much all of our maps. Also, we use a lot uh, OSMAND, uh, OSMN, uh, this app for uh, gathering GPS points, tracking, navigation. Uh, it's, it's, tough, it's often better than other sources uh, of information in the field in remote areas. Um, and today we will discuss a bit more how we use it in, uh, in some uh, uh, analysis like for uh, population estimates and uh, for our activity monitoring and planning. First, a few words about community engagement. Uh, so on the map on the left, you can see the blue pins where we had mapathons. And um, in uh, red, you can see where we mapped. So you, you definitely can see connections, for example, between London and DRC or Czech Republic or Slovakia and Madagascar. But we also have mapathons organized by our GIS officers in, for example, DRC or Zimbabwe mapping very near. In case of Zimbabwe, it was, I think, in Mozambique. And we organize about 100 mapathons a year. Now we, it's been more than 60. Most of them are public. 
good part is corporate, and we work also with universities and secondary schools. And since the beginning, we've had on the tasking manager something like 269 projects. And you might be curious in which country is the most. So the top countries have been the Central African Republic, about 150. Then DRC, about 100 hot tasking manager projects. And also Nigeria, about 70 projects. And we have an informal network of Missing Maps champions whom I train, I do capacity buildings, and they function basically as community multipliers, animating, facilitating um, the interactions in the communities in their countries. And uh, this year we have also set up a Missing Maps resource app, something like the Youth, Map, uh, Youth Mappers Academy, uh, with lots of resources for them to do different kinds of mapathons. And on this map, um, you can see the operations we have supported in the first four months of this year. Uh, by now, we have successfully concluded, I counted six campaigns this year, um, and uh, it was about 10 campaigns and projects ongoing, you can see in the beginning of the year, to support, uh, for example, patient tracking for medical operations such as NOMA, that's a facial disease that is um, unfortunately present in northwestern Nigeria. Uh, flood response and also change detection on map swipe in Sudan and also southern Madagascar after the cyclones that hit in March. Um, and also just in general when we are going to start new projects such as for example in Afga Af Afghanistan, it's often rural areas that are virtually not mapped. There have been at least four contexts like this this year, often actually in countries that have been in long-term instability or conflict where it's really crucial for reference maps to enrich the OSM. And uh, I would like to present you a couple projects uh, where we use the OSM data to do some analysis. For example, in Mozambique, a couple years back, there was this massive cholera outbreak. And MSF responded by planning to uh, vaccine, vaccinate about 300,000 people. Uh, they had a short time to do so. So they uh, asked for the support of the GIS specialist there. So the GIS specialists went there, asked the team what they needed, and the first thing they wanted was a map of the area that they were going to vaccinate. Uh, they needed to understand where the population was, where were the main point of interest, uh, so that they could um, so that they could plan how to uh, choose their vaccination sites so that it could reach the population easily. So uh, one of the first things that the GIS specialist uh, did when he was there uh, was to ask for missing map support to uh, map the city of Tete, which was uh, the city uh, that was the most affected, where MSF had planned most of its vaccination. So this is the before and after a uh, missing map contributor uh, mapped the area. So you can see huge difference. So if you try to plan a vaccination campaign there, what does it mean? Where is the population? what are the potential sites. Uh, so it looked much better after that with as well some key uh, schools and uh, like other places relevant for the population that could be used potentially as vaccine sites as well. Uh, so what the GIS specialist did from that is that he used the buildings uh, that we could saw drew from the volunteer uh, of missing map, and, and he uh, then used his uh, field, uh, his field view on the city to be able to identify which of these buildings were most likely in residential area, which of these buildings were most likely more commercial and industrial. So he would remove these ones to keep to focus on the residents, and then he would see on which area were most likely unifamiliar houses versus multiple story and he would weight the building differently so he would uh, add an extra weight for the building in an area which normally has more story because then there would be more people uh, he would also add weight according to the 
the area of each building to 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 take into account that there's probably more people living in big areas that probably have multiple apartments, for example. So with these uh, this weight, these building, he was able to create the map uh, that you can see there, where you can see the the brighter red, meaning the more population per square meter. Obviously, it's not a precise science, but it did help the team a lot. So they use that to choose which should be the, the fixed vaccination sites, so where there would be more population density, and which area should have mobile sites, because probably that one day would be enough to cover this area and then move to another one, so they could organize themselves better. And so the feedbacks were really positive in the sense that the team felt like they were more efficient, they were able to cover more people with the vaccine, uh, and in the less time, all this to stop uh, the outbreak of cholera quicker. Another example happened in Burundi, where in Burundi, uh, the main cause of mortality, at least in this area, um, is uh, malaria. So malaria is a disease that is transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, so basically, like a person cannot infect another person. It's really through the mosquitoes that bites the human and the human gets infected. So basically, if you want to stop the transmission of mal malaria, you need to do something about the mosquitoes. So there's a couple approach where you can distribute mosquito nets. We do that a lot, but obviously they tear like the mosquito net tier, they have a limited uh, um, efficiency. Uh, and so in this context, we wanted to try larva siding. So larva siding, the, the breeding site of the mosquito. In this area, it was in the houses. So that's where the mosquito would reproduce themselves. So um, MSF wanted to uh, spread the inside of the house with the per permission of the household, obviously, to, uh, to um, limit the transmission of malaria. To be efficient, this technique, you need to spray at least 85% uh, of the households. Otherwise, according to WHO, it will not have a significant impact. Uh, so, because the team wanted to do this job, they asked for the support of a GIS specialist, thinking it would help. Uh, so, again, one of the first reflex of the GIS specialist was to ask support of missing map to map the households in the big area that uh, they wanted to cover for larva siding activities. Uh, so, in about a month, they uh, mapped more but about about 74,000 houses that's a lot An impressive work so with that um, the GIS specialist was able to convert each building each house into one centroid point that you can see and he imported those into Usman and he, he um, classified them into, like daily would classify the houses that had not been sprayed with the house that were to spray. So the team would be able to navigate in Osman and find the house and knowing precisely if they had been covered the day before or they could not be reached. Because there's also the, the case that if the people are not there that day, they're at the market, they're anywhere else we won't spray their house so we have to come back if we want to be efficient we have to come back and if we don't have uh, a trace of which houses were able to be covered which one were not at that time it's hard for the team to remember so at the end of each day the GIS specialist was able to uh, produce such map where he would show to the team exactly what they had covered what was to cover so they could plan which team should go where and like bringing what quantity of what, uh, so they could uh, respond efficiently to this. And again, the feedback were super positive. It seemed that it had had a significant impact into decreasing the malaria rates in the area. So they, they continued with this approach uh, until today so far. Basically for the indoor residual spraying technique, uh, it needs to be also repeated so that it's effective and then the rate of mosquitoes and malaria decreases in the area and it was repeated three years in a row in Burundi in Ruigi that's what you see on the map and also in the province of Rianzoro this past year 
And we have also adopted this technique in Angumu DRC this year, where we were just mapping the area at June Mapathon, actually, as it was starting the spraying of the houses. And it's not just the houses, but also the outdoor toilets and the animal sheds that get sprayed because the mosquitoes tend to converge there as well. And so our colleagues were able to reach 97%, 12% over the recommended rate. Third example, briefly, is from Chad, Bungor, where missing maps volunteers were activated for a measles vaccination survey. Um, Chad is unfortunately one of the countries in the world with lowest rate of vaccination against measles, about 25% only. And a lot of the children do not actually get to the point that they get the second shot, which is necessary for it to be effective. And so, there has been essentially a measles epidemic since 2018 with another outbreak around April this year. And our chat um, response team um, aimed with the project to vaccinate 72,000 children in the Bongor district. We activated uh, the Missing Maps volunteers on May 11, and we knew that the survey was supposed to start in a week. Uh, it was intermediate and advanced mappers project, and it was done in two days on May 13. Thousands of buildings were added to SM. You can see how quickly they were popping up. And thanks to that, our colleagues could randomize a sample and check on the vaccination coverage. And um, that is important because often the easiest doors to knock on to find out if the vaccination happened there are also the easiest doors to come and vaccinate. So that's why it needs to be randomized. And, and it has been used also in chat previously, about four years ago. Uh, Jan Bom, my predecessor, did a story map on that. And we have also mapped in chat the refugee camps, um, Miles and Kunugu, where literally about three quarters of the buildings were missing from OSM, then it was used for orientation and planning activities. So in conclusion, you can see that the scale of the use of OSM has been huge for MSF, but also probably for other humanitarian organizations in these areas, as they will be able to use it as it stays available, this data. And the GIS uh, has been essential to timely and accurate response in contexts such as displacement, instability, conflict, disease outbreaks. And that has helped make our operations more efficient. And in this effort, we are grateful to the volunteers, to the different OSM and Missing Maps communities for their support and for their partnership with universities, with corporate partners, with schools, and with the missing math partners. <laughs> Any questions? Mike. So hello, um, you know me. Uh, so um, the um, has it been possible at some point to completely eradicate a certain disease? And has that is is that possible? Um, I don't know because if you if you reach such high quality and such high rates, it should should be possible, no? Does it hurt? Yeah. Okay. Okay, the thing with measles and cholera, uh, those two examples I know a bit more, they are tra very highly transmittable disease. So you don't need much for it to be transmitted uh, and people travel. So even if you vaccinate an area, you will have an impact significant on this area if it's well done. But there will be cases around and a couple of years back, there will be new children, new people that will be, again, at risk. 
So it's it's an ongoing work. The little knowledge that I have on this. But I think it's fair to say that thanks to GIS monitoring and epidemiological follow up, it has been possible to nip some of the outbreaks at the beginning. For example, the yellow fever outbreak this year in Chad. Or this morning, Sarah told me about using GIS for a disease that I didn't even know about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maroc? Um, Marburg. Uh, Marburg. There's a vaccine yet for that. But yeah, we, we could track the first case before there was too much transmission. So if you're able to isolate, treat people before they infect others, then you can have a significant impact. So that's also what we aim for as GIS. Uh, and of course, far from eradicating Ebola, but it has helped a lot to lower the transmission by the case tracing in Guinea. Yeah. These, these diseases like For Ebola, example, Marburg, like they take more time to transmit. Uh, so if you were able to catch the, the people before like a certain point, they most likely won't have transmitted it to their families. Yeah, I just want to know uh, the extent you collaborate with local uh, open street map uh, communities in the countries you work, especially for ground data collection. That's an excellent question. We try to collaborate with them, um, especially in places where we have contacts. It's part of the workflow. For example, OSMDRC in mapping Ruchuru. Uh, post the volcano um, Nirangongo explosion this past year, we have worked together um, also with OSM Madagascar in mapping the rural south of Madagascar, and we took into account some of their advice in terms of the task instructions. As for big countries, like for example Nigeria, where there are a lot of OSM communities and, and youth mappers chapters, I've started talking to some of the people here how to do it because it's not evident, so we should have a chat afterwards. But we are definitely open to it and up for it. Uh, we have some questions from the online participants. Uh, the first one is how challenging is it possible to mobilize vol volunteers to contribute to mapping tasks? Um, do you have a core set of contributors uh, that map every month? I didn't catch the last part of the question, concept of contributors. Uh, do you have a core set of uh, contributors that map every month? Uh, it has not been that difficult to engage volunteers since there is already a sizable community. So people bring their friends and then when we need to do urgent mapping, thankfully we can reach out through some of the teams on the tasking manager and also use for example, Missing Maps Facebook and Twitter to call on mappers to help, and that has worked really well. Uh, of course, as in any community, the challenge is retention of the more advanced mappers, so we are always looking uh, for ideas and ways to improve that and to, to keep working with our validators. That has been a small group of loyal people within the overall community, I would say, in terms of, you know, dozens, probably 20, 30 people validating most of our tasks. And we are aware that that's a huge uh, workload, basically. It takes a lot of time. In terms of people coming back every month, what has helped is doing regular mapathons, such as the London mapathons, or in the Czech Republic and Slovakia, we also do mapathons about monthly. So then people keep meeting and they keep coming back also for the community, for learning new stuff and for the exchange. It's a bit harder where activities happen every once in a while, maybe once or twice a year. Uh, the second question is, how do you use OSM after natural disasters? I mean, we still need to reach the communities. We need to know which roads we can use to access the community. Uh, the extent of the flood or of the damage. Uh, we need to know like if there are communities, small villages, 
that uh, are less known and that are probably not on other maps. Uh, so if we want to reach out, making sure everybody's okay, that uh, they're, they still have access to basic health care or more specialized health care, then we need to know who's been affected. So yes, it's, it's definitely super helpful. Yeah. And quick note on um, some of the natural disasters or occurrences being interlinked with health, such as, for example, the long-lasting droughts in the south of Madagascar, which has led to really alarming rates of malnutrition. So that's an approach that we are exploring in MSF called planetary health. And uh, in that sense, we are looking to pilot sometimes, you know, using GIS data, for example, on such cases, Mozambique, where we continue to map in the Nampula province, and then see what is the interlinkage and sometimes also share this at talks. So that's something we've been looking into for the past year. But obviously, it's not a causal linkage that's direct. It's um, a linkage that we still yet to explore all of the factors that are playing into it. You are tracking a lava side application by household. Um, is it a household that you are tracking or an upper street map building? Uh, do you put, do you put extra attributes on uh, an open street map building in your private part of your data model, or do you have a specific business object uh, which is the household? Uh, the alarm by the glass. If the larva develops, even if it's in a building that does not have people inside, if there are people around it. I meant in terms of data model. Uh, do, do you keep track of um, the household as an open street map building, or is it something different? Because the points on your map, it looked like you were uh, attributing uh, buildings. It was OSM awesome buildings. That's the base for these door-to-door -door activities. Then we also use applications like Kobo that the team leader has where they mark if it has been sprayed or uh, refused and other uh, data that stays, uh, you know, internal to the organization and that we don't push to OSM afterwards. Do you, do you put uh, an extra stable identifier for the household on the building or you just rely on the building uh, ID in OpenStreetMap? Uh, so it's the job of the GIS specialist. So he uses uh, the buildings. He clean, he clean uh, that that uh, shape file, and then he just creates centroids. It creates his attribute tables, and then he links that with like the ODK or Kobo for those who are familiar. Results every day. He just links it. Uh, one more. Good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.